Good morning. This morning's readings from Jonah, and it's chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me, all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Good, morning, Good to be with you again. Happy New Year. At least somebody's listening. Um, as we were worshipping, I just sort of sensed that we should just begin with a moment of silence. Um, so I'd like us just to be quiet for a moment and open our hearts. I think sometimes it's easy to forget this is the Word of God. And uh, I'd just like us to just invite us to open our hearts to hear God afresh this morning. And I just felt God say to me, but I think to us, why did you come here today? Why did you come here today? And are you ready to open your hearts to listen to what I have to say to you this morning? So Father, we bring our hearts before you this morning. We come before a story where somebody who thought they had it all sewn up <coughs> through a word from, from, from you, a word of God, had their life turned upside down. And I pray that you would help us to continue to be people who are willing to have our lives turn upside down in order to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, it's the 15th, I think, of January. How are the New Year's resolutions going? Do you make New Year's resolutions? No, some people do, some people don't. I'm not a great New Year's resolution sort of person. Probably too many failures in the past of getting to the second week of January and already having messed up. But I, I suppose New Year's resolutions are a good thing. They sort of get us out of being stuck, don't they? We get to the end of the year and we realise that we've kind of taken on some bad habits and we've got a lot of stuff that we've kind of accumulated. And it's time for a fresh start in habits and good, pra good practices. Um, but there's a little bit of think sometimes it's all about trying a bit harder as well, particularly in the spiritual life. We think, that's it, I'm going to do the Bible in a year this year. I'm going to get up at five and see the sunrise or whatever. I'm going to pray a bit harder, and this is going to change my spiritual life. And I've been there, believe, believe me. But I think with the, this book of Jonah, there's also something about... Um, an openness to God that isn't about trying harder, but allowing God to do his work in us. And the book of Jonah is about a lot of things people have written. I mean, goodness knows how many books have been written uh, on Jonah. But one perspective on it is that it's a one person's journey from something that was quite comfortable and neat and ordered and static into something that's dynamic. And adventurous. Jonah goes on this journey from quite, I think, quite a kind of rigid faith to something that's 
through chaos and disruption is a dynamic relationship with God. And I don't know about you, but when I first came to faith or when I first kind of grasped faith in some way, I thought, this is what faith in God is about. It's believing in Jesus and that Jesus has given you a new status as a child of God. And this gives you a new status as a citizen of heaven. And that your task, my task, our task, is in a sense to live up to that status, to keep it you know, nice and kind of all sorted so that when we get to heaven, we're kind of ready for heaven. And in a sense, that's true. I'm not, I'm not dissing that. But I guess my faith has developed. And I now think that faith in Christ is not just a status, but a journey and an adventure and a pilgrimage, if you like. That we get to participate in this grace of God that is kind of a flow, is kind of a movement and that we step into the flow of that grace and, and, and grow and deepen through that experience in our daily life now. So we get to inhabit and participate in eternal life now that will continue uh, into heaven. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, which is that great state, well, many, one of many great statements of grace, says this. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And, you know, at first reading, you think that's what grace is about. We've gained access into a status in which we now stand. So all we have to do is kind of, you know, keep standing, don't move, you know, eternity's right around the corner. Stay firm in that status. But actually, the Greek for the gained access, it kind of means being introduced to uh, a king or a queen and kind of welcomed into their world. You're kind of stepping across the threshold into a new world. Uh, and, a, and a world in which you're then in, in, invited to live. And the message translation puts it like this. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has throw, already thrown open his doors to us. And so I think the life of faith is like this continual kind of threshold moment where we're invited to sort of let go a little bit more of ourselves in order that God can receive more of us into himself. We're constantly stepping over this threshold into this life of grace. We're stepping into grace. But it's not a once in a lifetime step into grace. It's a constant stepping into the grace of God. And so I think Jonah speaks into that because it's this one, it's this story of one person wrestling with this revelation that God is inviting him to constantly step into this life of adventure, this, this life of grace. So how does, how does the Jonah story help with that? Well, just a, a few, that, I mean, there's so much one could say, but firstly, he prays. Prayer is throughout this story. In the beginning of our passage, it says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Um, I've never prayed inside a fish before. I don't know if anybody else has, but it must have been quite an interesting experience. But the thing I take from this is that even in the constraints and darkness and depths of what it meant to be in the belly of the whale, uh, Jonah prays to the Lord his God. And this Jonah, this book, is, I think, a book, of, uh, book, book that was written in, in exile. So you know the story of Israelites. At one point, everything's destroyed in Jerusalem and they're called off into exile in Babylon. In Babylon. So they've lost that world that they thought kind of made sense in terms of their own faith, where there's a temple and a sacrificial system and the king of Israel and they've got land and they've, all, they've got it all sorted and it's all destroyed and completely uh, disorientated. And they've got to redefine and rediscover what it means to have faith in God whilst living in Babylon with a pagan, uh, pagan nation. And Nineveh is that one place where God cannot be. They're foreign, they're pagan, uh, 
and they don't, they don't believe in the gods that Israel believes in. And the sea is also a place that's chaotic, it's wild, it's a dangerous place full of monsters. It's a place where God cannot be or act. And yet in that place, in the, in the heart of the monster, in the middle of the sea, Jonah prays to the Lord his God. And I think our tendency, I know my tendency, is to reduce God down to something that we can kind of keep control of. We, we define God in our own image and then kind of use him for our own devices. So how do we pray to a God who is God? Not just the God of our own definition of him, but the God who's the Lord God of all creation, the Lord and Father of Jesus Christ, and the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Because that's not easy. We live in a world that has reduced the whole of creation to a material universe. And the idea of a transcendent God is an idea that's deeply, deeply countercultural. And even if we trust in the transcendence of God, we still have to live that out in our daily lives. And I think all of us, and I, you know, I'll put my hand up and say, I struggle with that. I struggle with doubt. And I struggle to believe in a God who is God, who can intervene in my life. But the story of Jonah is there to, to, to tell us that even in a culture that doesn't believe that, our task, our call, is to inhabit a faith that believes that God can intervene in our daily lives. So two suggestions from the story of Jonah of how we might practice that trust in a God who is God. And the first is to be brave. But not to be brave in the sense of kind of, you know, heroic, but to be brave in the sense of vulnerable and in surrender. So who saw the boy, the horse, the mole and the fox this Christmas? Yeah, quite a lot of us. If you didn't see it, it's worth watching. Maybe you've already read the book. But you may, you may not know, you may know that Charlie, the story of that phenomenon was a conversation between Bear Grylls and Charlie Mackesy. So Charlie's a great friend of Bear, Bear Grylls. And Bear Grylls said to him, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? And you know what Bear Grylls is like. He's climbed Everest, he's bitten heads off snakes. You know, he's, whatever there is that's brave, Bear has done it. And you know, Charlie's a little bit different. And he said, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? And Charlie said, said ask for help. And so, you know, courage in the, sense of per, in, in the sense of personal growth and spiritual growth, I think is not just bravery or courage, it can be that. Of course, there's a lot of take courage and, uh, in the Bible, but sometimes and very often it's about letting go, being vulnerable and saying, God, I've come to the end of my rope. Will you pick me up and be God in my life? And this journey of Jonah... Um, I think, is a kind of U-shaped journey throughout the whole story. Because it starts in Jerusalem, and if you've been to Jerusalem, you'll know it's, well, even if you haven't, you'll know it's on a mountain. He then journeys to Joppa, where he, where he gets on a boat, and he goes out into the sea, and then the boat, there's a storm, and then he's thrown out into the sea and goes down into the depths of the sea, and then it says, as we heard in chapter 2, the engulfing waters surrounded me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was trapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down. And that's kind of like the lowest point in the story. And then we get to verse, the end of verse 6. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. And from then on it's as if the journey begins to take an upward uh, direction again. And that, that moment in the belly of the whale is when you brought my life up from the pit. And, you know, the book of Jonah is only 48 verses long. And that verse is verse 23 and verse 24, is that hinge point in the journey. So it's like the writer is saying right at the very heart of this, of this, of this journey is a willingness to let go and allow God to, to bring us up from the depths. 
Henri Nouwen, I'm sure many of you have heard of, heard of. He was a Dutch Catholic priest and, and uh, academic. And uh, he became, in the early 90s, he became fascinated. He went on sabbatical and he became fascinated by this circus troupe uh, called the Flying Rudleys, or the Flying Rodleys, I think they were called. And he spent, he spent a lot of time with this circus troupe. And um, he kind of got obsessed with them, but he began, he began to see all these kind of spiritual insights and metaphors about, uh, about circus uh, acts, and particularly the trapeze. And he saw in the trapeze, in this movement, where the, per the trapeze artist is being swung between one trapeze and the next and, and letting go and catch it and being, and being caught, he saw in that a metaphor for our relationship with God. And that the key insight, that in that moment when you're letting go in order to be caught, you can't grasp the catcher. You have to stay still. You have to completely open yourself and find a moment of stillness. And in that moment of stillness, trust that the catcher will catch you. And he said, it's like that in the life of discipleship. We can't grasp onto God. Sometimes we just need to open our hearts and open our hands and be still. Find that moment of stillness in which God can catch us. And we have to be, allow ourselves to be caught. And I think that's what happens in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. Jonah surrenders and he allows himself to be brought up from the depths of the whale. And I think that's how very often we step into grace. It's not so much trying harder, praying harder, being braver, but very often being vulnerable, saying help, being still and letting go and allowing ourselves to be caught. And the second thing is to embrace disruption. Um, at the end of this chapter, it says, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <laughs> I quite like that verse, I don't know why. But I like the fact it's in the Bible, you know, that Jonah gets vomited by a whale. And that he's had this epiphany, you know, God has spoken to him and he's like, and maybe you've had moments like that, and you think, yes, life's going to be different. And actually, at the beginning of that new chapter of Jonah's life, he's covered in whale vomit. You know, I think there's something ironic about that. But anyway, the point is that the, the, the whale has been commanded. The Lord commanded the fish. And that's another theme throughout Jonah, is that the Lord commands the storm. The Lord provides the fish. He commands the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry land. He then provides this vine in chapter 4. And there's a constant sense that God is in control, but the, but the intervention that God brings is constantly disrupting Jonah from wherever he is and wh whatever he's doing. And of course, the call that he gives Jonah in the first place at the beginning of chapter 1 and then again at the beginning of chapter 3 completely throws his life into disarray. And so it seems to me that the, one of the means that God uses to, to invite Jonah and invite us deeper into him, into his grace, is disruption. You know, it's deeply, deeply uncomfortable. God literally turns Jonah's life upside down, throws him into chaos, and invites him to step into that grace. And of course, you know, this is a pattern that we see throughout the Bible. Moses is sold into slavery. The exodus, the exile that I've already mentioned. The call of the disciples to leave everything and follow Jesus. The death of Jesus, just when they kind of thought, hey, this is great, we've been around Jesus for a long time, this is getting cool, he says, I'm going to leave you. The resurrection of Jesus, the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, the death of Stephen and the persecution of the early church. All of these things are these kind of threshold moments 
When everything kind of seems like maybe we've gone, I've got settled here, bang, God intervenes and chaos ensues again. And God is inviting his people deeper and deeper into an experience and relationship with him. So I think, you know, there will be times when God uses disruption. I'm not saying that God is in all disruption or that God brings the disruption that we feel in our, that we might be experiencing in our lives, but that in the midst of that disruption there is grace. And um, I mean, I said this earlier, this is going to sound really lame compared to Jonah or maybe some of the things that some of you are going through that feel like a disruption at the moment. But a few, few years ago, we had a nest of squirrels in our house. And um, I kind of ignored the scratching noises I was hearing in the roof space for a bit. And then I realized I couldn't ignore them anymore because there were clearly more than one. And, um, and some of them were, had clearly got into spaces in the roof space that they hadn't been in before. And one of them was the ceiling above our bedroom. So we were waking up hearing squirrels like going across and I thought oh, we've got to do something about this so I got a man to come and do something about him about it but he he didn't basically he thought he sorted them and it hadn't and they came back and I'm like I've already spent a lot of money trying to get rid of these squirrels and they're back what am I going to do so I was feeling really frustrated about the situation which is I know just kind of first world problems and everything but nevertheless um, and then I was praying one morning just get at the beginning of my working day, and I could hear the squirrels in the reef, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm oh what am I going to do to get rid of those squirrels? I haven't got any more money. And I just felt God say, listen to the squirrels. Listen to the squirrels. And to cut a long story short, basically I discovered that, you know, these squirrels, they build their nests, and then at some point they push the young out of the nest because the young want to stay in the nice, your nice comfy attic, it's nice in there, they want to stay in there, but the mother wants to push the young squirrels out of the nest, and that's kind of, some, one, of one of the things that was happening in our house. And I felt like God was saying, you know, you're a little bit like those young squirrels, you've kind of got used to this cosy nest. You know, I was doing things that kind of seemed like they were quite ordered, and I had a nice role, and I was getting paid for what I did. And it basically took me to a period of my life where I decided to take some risks and I let go of one or two things and I started to go and meet a few people with no agenda just to sort of build relationships and see where that took me. And it, it took me into a new chapter, I think, of my, what I feel is my vocation. But it all came from that word, um, listening. And I, I think sometimes we need to, dis, to listen to the disruption of, in our lives because in that disruption may well be uh, the voice of God. And of course we've been through a massive disruption through COVID and that's a tough, tough period and many of us have had some really, really tough things to have to deal with through that whole period and maybe, maybe we still are and I'm not saying that something like COVID is somehow the hand of God but that within the disruption that COVID has brought I think God has spoken and, it, uh, and, and may well be inviting us or has invited us into new periods of, of discipleship and new periods of growth uh, in our lives but we need to listen to that and we need to slow down enough to be able to listen to that and to, and to appropriate and to put into practice some of the things that God might have been saying to us. And that's the grace of disruption. That disruption contains within it that threshold, that opportunity to step into something more of what God is offering us. And that might, mean, that might mean letting go and, and trusting. Because sometimes when we make that step, we have no idea where it's going. But trusting that like the trapeze artist, we will be held uh, in the arms of God. And the thing is that when you read, the, you think, okay, if you were to read, I don't know how well you know Jonah, but if you were to read on, you'd think, right, that's it, Jonah's got it. He's going to be fantastic now. That's not what happens at all. Jonah is still a bit of a mess. And he still makes mistakes and he's still wrestling with God. And I actually think there's something really significant about that because when you get this, 
it's not like you learn it for eternity. You keep, it's like God is constantly asking us to practice this stepping uh, into his grace. It's a, it's a discipline that we have to inhabit in our daily lives uh, uh, you know, on, on a daily basis. Yeah, I think I'm done here. So I'm going to pray <laughs> that we might be people, not just individuals, but communities, communities of faith that can inhabit disruption because we live in a world of deep disruption. I wasn't going to say this, but I was speaking to Nadia and I met Vladimir before the service and I'm deeply aware that I don't really understand what I'm talking about, but people like Nadia and Vladimir know it deeply. And maybe they know the grace of God in disruption more than some of us will ever. And maybe we should talk to people like like Nadia and Vladimir and others who, by God's grace, are with us from Ukraine. So we have much to learn from people like that. And to know that God, even in the darkest, most horrendous experiences and places of our world, is at work, bringing us the grace that he invites us into every day. Let's pray. Yeah, Father... um, I just pray that you would come by your Holy Spirit and we will all be experiencing one level of disruption or another in our lives. And I pray that you would take us from here and continue to speak to us. As we worship now, I pray that we would lift your name but also hear your voice. And may we be people who don't settle for comfort Don't settle for order. Don't settle for being static. But are vulnerable enough and can surrender enough to keep stepping into what you have for us in our lives. In Jesus' name.